Good evening, everybody. Welcome. My name is Katiana Ballantyne. I'm the city councilor for Ward 7. It's nice to have you here today. Uh, we are here to listen to uh, and get updates from the city staff and the mayor of what the, they've been working on for the last uh, six months. They were here in the spring. But um, what I thought I would do was just ask a few questions so we could get a sense of who's in the room and you know who your neighbors are. So I would ask, would you raise your hand if this is the first time as a re at a Resistat meeting? Awesome, welcome. Thank you. So would you raise your hand if you have um, lived here less than a year? Welcome. Uh, raise your hand if you've lived here less than two years. Less than five. Or excuse me, I, I should say five, right? Thanks, I got what I said. So um, if you've lived here uh, between five and 10 years, if you, go I'm going higher. I'm going higher. I finish with you because uh, you know you're very special. So if you've lived here um, uh, between 10 and 15 years, raise your hand. Between 15 and 20. Between 20 and 25. Uh, 25 and 30. I had to get my hand in here. Okay. Um, anybody who has lived here their entire lives, raise your hand. Awesome. <laughs> Woo. Thank you. So would you raise your hand if you have any children in the school system? In the Somerville Public Schools. Um, would you raise your hand if you have grandchildren in the Somerville Public Schools? Okay. Would you raise your hand if um, you ride your bike or use public transit to go to work? Would you raise your hand if you use your car to go to work? Okay. Um, would you raise your hand if you have an opportunity to walk the Alewife Brook and the, uh, the boardwalk around there? Would you raise your hand if you walked it when before the boardwalk was there so it was a path? So it was just the path on the Arlington side. Okay, awesome. I did too. Um, raise your hand. I think last time people asked me if to have people raise their hand if they have pets. So if you have uh, pets, raise your hand. Okay. Is there anything else you would like to know about the people who are in the room? Can someone shout out a question? Uh, raise your hand if you do not live in Ward 7. Okay. Um, okay, people have asked, uh, if you rent, would you raise your hand? If you own, would you raise your hand? Okay. Okay, one more question. What would somebody, does anybody have a question they'd like to? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you have, uh, raise your hand if you've had children who attended the public schools and they're now um, adults, and that makes you an empty nester, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right, so um, we'll start off, and I will pass this over. Is it to the mayor or is it to Taylor? Okay, and thank you so much for coming. I will be here the whole evening. I'll be the last person to leave, so if anybody wants to talk to me about anything or they want a clarification, you know, come see me. Thanks. All right, good evening. My name is Taylor Coe. I'm the Resi Stack Coordinator for the city. Um, just a quick note on logistics. Um, I can turn it up too. 
Is that better? Yes, okay. Um, so restrooms are outside the hall to your right. A water fountain is there as well, and we have cups up here if you um, get thirsty. So the agenda tonight is pretty full. We are going to cover a lot of different topics. We won't be doing too deep of a dive into any specific topic, but we do hope to take your questions. Um, we ask that you try to hold your questions um, for each speaker to the very end of their slides. Um, and staff will be here uh, after the presentation as well, and these slides will be posted online at summervillema.gov slash resistat. Um, so quick updates, our Summer Vision 2040 committee has been hard at work drafting topic chapters. Those chapters are available for review at summerville.civiccomment.org slash summervision. Um, and if you also want to submit your feedback via email, you can email planning at summervillema.gov. Um, for more information on Summer Vision 2040, you can visit the website summervision2040.com. Summer Baby is a great program that the city offers. Um, it's a universal, free, and multilingual home visiting program um, to welcome our newest residents or our newborns um, the best start in life by connecting them to different resources as well as gifting them a welcome baby bag um, with a few gifts. We have multiple points of contact in different languages. Um, we also have this printed out on the side table over there if you um, are expecting a child into your family or if um, you know of a family that may be interested in this program. These are some other resources, um, including a Spanish language prenatal class, as well as some programs that are available to um, children that are all the way up to three years old. This is also printed out on the table on the side if you are interested um, in this information. So our lead service line replacement program recently received new funds. Um, if the goal of this program is to replace all non-copper um, or lead lines, so if, you, um, if your residence is serviced by a line made of lead or non-copper, you can check at summervillema.gov slash lead services. If it does turn out that your residence is serviced by a line like this, um, it is possible to have it replaced free of charge by the city. Applications are due by December of this year if you would like to be considered for replacement in the spring of 2020. Um, for more information on this, you can visit the website or contact the engineering department at extension 5400. We also have handouts on the table available as well. So our Office of Sustainability and Environment is encouraging us to rethink reusable as well as recyclable materials. Um, we often see recycling in the news a lot and we're thinking a lot about contamination. Um, there are two big types of contamination. So a lot of you probably use the zero sort cart at home, um, which just means lots of different recyclable materials can go in there. The first type of contamination is a bit more subtle. So if you end up throwing out something um, or just you know one or more items that are not recyclable into the bin, it does slow down our process of sorting those recyclable materials and it ultimately does drive up the cost. The other type of contamination has to do with food or liquids. Um, so if you've ever wondered if it really matters if you kind of rinse out an almost empty coffee cup or maybe a yogurt container before throwing it out, it does end up making a really big difference. It can sometimes contaminate other materials such as clean paper and cardboard, which are recyclable, um, and it can also slow down the sorting process. Things that we do want to continue recycling include clean metal, um, glass, rigid, plastic, and paper containers, as well as clean paper and cardboard. Things that we do not want to recycle that may not be as more intuitive is um, plastic bags, plastic wrapper film, which often does get caught in the recycling sorting machines, um, and anything with food on it, as I mentioned previously. We do have this great tool called the Somerville uh, Waste Wizard, um, which just allows you to double check if something is actually recycled or not. So we do encourage you to use that tool. Um, RecycleSmartMA.org slash FAQ also has some really great information um, on recycling processes as well. The Powderhouse School Project. So this past Monday, we did break ground for the park. Um, we're really excited about this project. The developer is doing the construction. Construction place, construction, excuse me, will be taking place this fall. Um, and we are hoping and aiming to have the park open in the spring of next year. The West Somerville Neighborhood Schoolyard is being redesigned. We have chosen a designer, um, CBA Landscape Architects, um, and we're hoping to have the next community meeting in November. Details on that will be posted on the website. Um, and if you have any questions or if you'd like more information, you can contact the Director of Parks, Arne Franzen. 
Um, so the Dillboy Field and Stadium, right now we are negotiating with DCR to renew our contract related to maintenance and operations for the field um, as well as the stadium. Once that contract is finalized, we are hoping to have um, the field and the stadium renovated. So Clarendon Hill Housing, um, the development team has submitted an application to the um, zoning board and they will be going to the zoning, zoning board of appeals soon. Um, if you are interested in this project, we encourage you to contact the planning department or visit the website at clarendonhill.org. Um, we do have a community, coming up, community meeting coming up at the end of this month next week on Wednesday, October 30th. Um, this is updates on negoti negotiations about the Somerville Tufts partnership agreement. Um, our contract expired last year in June, I believe, and um, we, are, we have some updates um, if, at this meeting if you are interested um, in learning more. This will be held at the Tab Building on Holland Street. Um, and for more information on this, we also have information on the city website, somervillema.gov slash Tufts Pilot. So the Green Line Extension project is on schedule to be open by the end of 2021. In order to make this project possible, we have had to close a number of bridges. Um, so just some quick updates on those. The Broadway Bridge is on track to reopen in March of next year. The Washington Street Bridge is now expected to be closed throughout the winter, but will be reopening in April of next year instead of in the fall. Um, the Medford Street Bridge will reopen in um, late spring of next year, and then School Street Bridge is expected to close in early spring of next year. The next public meeting for this um, will be in November, so stay tuned. There will be more information on the city website. Um, and we understand that this has been a very um, challenging time. We do appreciate your patience and your feedback. Um, we are doing our best to remain vigilant regarding traffic management. So we do have an interdepartmental team that's coordinating with our state partners. Um, these members include people from fire, police, mobility, engineering, traffic and parking, communications, as well as other staff. And we do take a three-pronged approach to this. Um, so we have advanced planning, daily monitoring, as well as rapid response. Some of efforts that we've um, done include the Reboot Your Commute campaign with the GLX team. So communications materials about um, commutes went out to 96 neighboring cities and towns, 84 media outlets, 29 medical facilities, 26 colleges, as well as large employers in the area. Um, we do hope to um, listen to your concerns regarding traffic and detours. So if you have concerns or questions, we do encourage you to continue reporting them through 311 or emailing construction at somervillema.gov. There are multiple ways to stay informed about um, this project. So the um, Mass DOT GLX updates are on the mass.gov slash GLX website. We also have a construction city newsletter and a construction website. Um, and if you are not signed up already, we do encourage you to sign up for city alerts as well as the city newsletter, which goes out weekly. All right, does anyone have any questions? Okay. So Brad Rawson from um, the Director of Mobility is here and they will be covering um, that topic. Okay, so if there is nothing else, I'm gonna hand it off to Chief Breen from Somerville Fire Department. Thank you, Taylor. <laughs> Charlie Breen, Fire Chief, glad to be here tonight. Ward six resident, however, I did marry a Ward seven girl, so. <laughs> I'm here to talk briefly about um, the past six months from April to September, uh, what we call the construction period, uh, all the bridges closed, uh, Union Square being dug up, uh, talk about emergency response times for the fire department. My presentation's brief, but the planning that went into the, um, before the closures was anything but brief. Uh, we spent a lot of time, myself and my staff, uh, looking at a lot of data. Uh, on response routes and response plans with the bridges being closed and the construction in Union Square. And uh, we did a lot of modifications on response plans and response routes. Um, we entered into agreements uh, for West Somerville with the Cambridge Fire Department. We have an automatic response from the Porter Square Fire Station on Mass Ave uh, for any reports of fires in West Somerville. We worked out an agreement with Boston for an automatic response from the Sullivan Square Station for anything in East Somerville. Um, and 
it just took a lot of a lot of planning um, to figure out how we were going to handle it. Um, as you can see, the same period last year, the average response time was three minutes and 29 seconds. Despite the Ball Square Bridge being closed, the Washington Street being closed, the Medford Street Bridge being closed, and the construction in Union Square, our response times in the same period this year are three seconds faster than they were the year before. So it, I, I can't give enough credit to the men and women of the fire department that are out there in the apparatus that have to navigate the streets every day, but they're doing a fantastic job and, and our plans are working. Um, we, a lot of interagency cooperation went on for these plans. I, I couldn't, we couldn't have done it on our own. Um, we, I was meeting with Brad Rawson probably daily when the bridges were closing and we still meet on a regular basis. I've got Brad on speed dial on my phone. Um, the police department as well, I'm, I'm constantly talking to Dave, uh, Lieutenant Matsakis, and Sergeant Whalen from the police department if we have issues uh, regarding responses. Every day when I come to work, I get a report uh, of responses for the previous 24 hours. And any responses that are excessive over five minutes, they get flagged and uh, I delve into what caused the delay. And uh, if there's something that can be done to uh, modify the response and increase the you know, our response times, we do it. So this is, uh, even though we have plans in effect, we're still, we're still looking at them every day as this goes on. And believe me, as Taylor mentioned, the dates for these bridges opening, um, nobody's gonna be more thrilled when, when these bridges open than myself. And somewhat selfish reasons, obviously it's gonna cause me less stress at work, but my wife drives my daughter to the high school every morning and we live on the other side of the Ball Square Bridge and for her to get to the high school every morning, sometimes I get an earful about the traffic. <laughs> and also, I have to take a serpentine route to get from my house to work. It used to be a straight shot down Broadway, now it's sort of a, a curve around before I can get my coffee at Magoon Square Dunkin' Donuts before I get into work. <laughs> um, one more thing I wanna talk about tonight is I wanna give a plug, whoop, give a plug to a career open house that we're having on November 16th at Fire Headquarters from 10 to noon. Um, what we've, we're seeing a troubling trend um, for the past number of years. Less and less uh, residents in the city are taking the fire department exam. And the less people that take the exam, the less of a pool of candidates we have to, to pick for the job. Also, diversity is very important to us. Um, we live in a diverse city, and we like to have the fire department reflect the diversity in the city. Uh, we've been working closely with the personnel department, Jennifer Mancia. We just recently filmed three videos, one in Spanish, one in Portuguese, and one in Haitian Creole, all by firefighters from those communities that speak that language to try to get word out to different communities in the city to take the exams. Um, we've been visiting different faith-based and community organizations to get the word out uh, to try to let people know about the, the job and what it is and to get some more interest in the department. I believe the next exam is gonna be March 21st, 2020. If you know anybody that's 19 years old, by March 21st, they're eligible to take the exam. The exam, they have to be a city resident. Uh, and I'd encourage them to stop by fire headquarters on November 16th. And uh, we'll have a number of firefighters from uh, Haitian firefighters, Spanish firefighters, Portuguese firefighters, uh, female firefighters, all there uh, to explain what the job is and uh, to promote the job. So uh, thank you very much. If anyone has any fire department related questions, I'd be glad to take them. Hi, Chief. Uh, Jim. Absolutely, I can look, we, can, we, we look at a lot of data and I'll add that to the list to keep, keep an eye on. Thank you. Cars are parked right up to the curb. 
curb. Um, it's very hard to make a right turn. On the corner of North Street? Yes. Okay. Um, it seems that should not be illegal. It shouldn't be. It, the, the city has an ordinance in place. It, vehicles have to be 20 feet from the intersection. Okay. I'll, I'll be in touch with the traffic and parking people and we'll put it on enforcement and keep an eye on it. Uh, we have a very good relationship with traffic and parking. They help us out a lot. And if necessary, I, um, if, if, if increased enforcement doesn't work, I can always look into designated as a fire lane on the corners. Thank you. Thank you. There's been no issues reported to me at all. Um, I haven't seen any delays in our response. I mean, it does slow us down maybe a second or two, but for the sake of safety, I, I'd rather lose a second or two and not have somebody get killed. Thank you very much. I'm gonna pass it off to the mayor. Thanks, Chief. Yeah, well-deserved round of applause. Sir. Fire Department, our first responders. Um, at the time, again, I, 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 you're right, Jim Monagle said they're up against it. They really do a bang-up job. And now the most congested region, not some of the entire region in, in the U.S., and we're doing uh, literally generations worth of infrastructure work in three years. Um, the good news is you're only going to hate us for a little while longer as bridges start to open up starting in March and April, and so the high school is on time. Um, it will be open for the next school year which we're really excited about. Uh, and that'll alleviate a lot of diversion and pressures around the Central Hill and stuff. And the Green Line is as well, 2021, uh, full operation. So full steam ahead in some of, in the Summer of Laugh project. So um, we're also paying the price of uh, some of these projects, some out of our control, but really the lesson learned about kicking that liability down the road for generations to come. It costs more. The inconvenience is, it gets to be more complex to do them, but uh, I'm excited we're doing them and the benefits are gonna be well worth it. Um, thanks for coming out tonight. For those of you, if it's your first time being here, thank you for participating. It's our opportunity to put some data and information in your hand. Residents help uh, create the agenda. Um, I am gonna talk, uh, you know, you hear a lot of us talk about um, in the community about the importance of our local economy. That goes uh, without saying. Uh, whether it's enhancing uh, the quality of life or, or for job creation, but what we really discuss and give you some data on is what the city is doing to ensure that economy is resilient, it's diverse, it continues to thrive. So tonight what I want to do is speak uh, a little bit about the many ways that the city is working to help what we call or uh, refer to our alternative economies uh, and small business uh, uh, really adapt and, and uh, sustain through a variety of changes and challenges that we're also facing uh, individually. Uh, well, we are real fortunate, we're also proud uh, to have a really, again, such an interesting and diverse local economy. Uh, we, some of we don't have just your typical businesses and chains we have, as is laid out here, your independent, small and micro businesses, as well as our maker and artist community. Anyone here in those categories? Anybody working at home or artist or, how about some of you who started the business in your past, maybe you're retired, or uh, I have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of respect and admiration for people who've taken that risk, because it's not easy, as we'll see. But also our self-employed residents and entrepreneurs and our startups, uh, again, as well as along with our new larger employees and national business that are coming to our transformational areas and that we're proud uh, to partner with. But uh, I think we can agree that our economic diversity, it, it just doesn't just fuel our city, it really defines us as a community. Uh, Somerville is known for uh, our makers and our unique small businesses and, and our artists and more at the same time, uh, they help s support really shared community goals. And through them, um, we help, uh, we work together to achieve goals like walkability and sustainability, uh, diversity and uh, job creation. Well, again, the big companies do get the headlines when they're choosing to locate in Somerville, like uh, Puma wants to bring their North American headquarters to assembly or you know, a tech company a life sciences company wants to come here, uh, the bulk of the local economy is made up in these categories. Um, and, and that's really important. Again, there are small, uh, creative, and independent businesses and entrepreneurs and our self status. So what I'm going to do is try to speak specifically about what we're doing to ensure that they're staying strong, 
and, 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 they're, and they're resilient and continue to thrive moving forward. An important question for us to internalize is how does this impact each and every one of us individually? And uh, I want to give just a few examples that, to help us think about that. Um, as uh, some of them made a bold goal several years ago to be carbon neutral by 2050, climate change is one of the greatest existential threats uh, facing the world today. And we are feeling the localized impacts every day in some of them. The communities come together to set forth our goals to, uh, for climate action in some of the climate forward goals that are achievable and implementable. And what we've done, and this should be of no surprise to those of us who pay attention, if not, I, I ask you all to pay attention to this, a third of our greenhouse gas emissions come from transportation, with nearly 60% uh, of that coming from passenger vehicles. And you've heard the data before repeated, 83% of the cars that come through our city every day don't start their trips in Somerville, nor do they end them here in Somerville. So let's keep that in the back of our minds as we think about how we're gonna support our local economy and also achieve our climate action goals. It's just cut through traffic. Years ago, up until mid-century, we had 20 rail and trolley stops. The interstate highway system came in under the Eisenhower program. In came our Interstate 93, the expansion of Route 28, secondary arterial, and we became the on and off ramp to Boston. That is going to stop and must stop if we're going to achieve our climate action goals. Um, because the third again of those greenhouse gases come from those vehicles. Most of them are single passenger vehicles you see every day on this row or other stretches of road in some of them. So again, if we want to reduce carbon emissions from transportation, we have to get people away from their cars. We have to make low carbon, equitable forms of transportation the easy choice. It can't just come down to a choice of convenience. So our goals in summer vision are shifting on new vehicle trips by 50% at a minimum to more biking, walking, public transportation has to be put into action if we're going to uh, achieve this. So. Uh, you know, we can also reduce the city's carbon footprint, though, if we support work models that require, on the other end, that require less commuting, such as entrepreneurs who can work out of their homes or at local uh, co-working spaces and building that resilient uh, local economy. Uh, another lens to think about this is affordability. It's, uh, it's the other crisis facing the metropolitan Boston region. It's affordability in housing. It's also affordability for those who want to start a business or maintain and thrive in their local business. Um, well, again, among the other factors, uh, one driver of affordability is, for example, residential taxes, uh, both for owners and renters, or taxes in general. So on the residential side, we have a goal in the city, to sh a part of our growth plan in some divisions, to shift the tax burden off the residential taxpayer to more on the commercial side. That's only done if we grow the commercial tax base. Um, and, that, and that's happening. We have a lot of the larger businesses, uh, companies come into places like Assembly, they'll come to Union, but they're also in Massachusetts, one of the challenges for cities and towns, you've heard me say this before, we have very little revenue raising authority at the local level. Our revenue under the law here comes from basically three areas, the state, the, which is local aid, property taxes, residential commercial, uh, or other revenue streams, local option taxes that we can adopt, or actually when you pay a ticket, or feed the meter, Believe it or not, it's going to a good place. Uh, so it's important that we try to diversify our revenue streams as much as possible, those rigid parameters. So um, if we can do, if we can build that local, diverse, resilient small business base, as well as the big ticket companies that come here, we're gonna continue to shift the burden off the residential taxpayer side um, and also onto the commercial side and alleviate that burden. And we're, we're, we're excited and fortunate enough in some of them that's, uh, that is starting to evolve here and then it's uh, starting to take place. Um, a healthy local economy, if we agree, also enhances our, our quality of life. Uh, we hear so often that so one of the things that so many of us love in this city is that we've enhanced the walkability, uh, the mobility options in our neighborhood districts and squares, including our biking infrastructure. Our happiness show, survey every uh, the year shows this and proves this as well. So we know that if we want residents to be happy living in Somerville, and then we need to have great neighborhoods that are thriving, that are robust, very active, where residents can run their errands here locally. They can shop, uh, they can eat, or they just feel connected to one another in the community. And that's why, as a city, we're working so hard to draw customers into our squares and into our business districts. And I'm gonna uh, discuss how we're doing that in some upcoming slides. But first, I wanna point out, there are pressures on our local economy uh, and that means we need to remain vigilant and, and helping our, our local businesses. 
Uh, again, we all know globally we're facing uh, climate change, uh, we're facing a growing population. This is the greatest demographic shift in this nation's history. Uh, we're, you know, since mid this is since mid-century, we young people or millennials or want to live in the urban core, people want to age in place in cities, we can walk, bike, be part of a local culture, public transportation, no longer want to be stuck out in the suburbs. And globally, 54% of the world's population lives in city regions like the metro Boston region. By 2050, that figure will grow to 75%. So we need to think about what kind of city and city region we're going to be moving forward. Who's going to live here? Are we going to plan a city just for cars or for people? Are we going to embrace the human scale? How are we going to take on the challenges of climate change, a housing, a housing crisis, uh, and many other, a mobility crisis, and many others? So. Uh, Locally, for our businesses in Somerville, again, we have new development coming that we need to manage. We have, uh, as we just mentioned, we see every day construction and infrastructure projects we need to mitigate. And we're part, of, again, of a nat national population shift uh, to the urban core that's putting pressure on commercial residents. But um, also businesses are facing the challenge of convenience and the shift to an online economy. Think about how we all shop. And over the last few years, they said, well, retail's been turned upside down. It has. I mean, how many, of you, how many of us really go to brick and mortar stores as often as we did several years ago? That's really changed, and we need to factor that in as we think about how we support uh, those businesses. Um, and on top of that, they face some specific challenges. They face competition from big box stores and chains still. Uh, they staffing challenges and barriers to startup capital. They might need information and training, and they always have to navigate red tape, no matter how official we become here locally. There's always that bureaucracy that sometimes can be an impediment uh, in, in to, to move forward. And some face equity issues, and the, they, these create barriers for, to entry for minority and other business owners. I'll give you some data on that. And as I mentioned, uh, construction and real estate, including rents, certainly present other challenges. And this is important to keep in mind, because it's not easy. Those of us who've been in this world, who started the business, who are thinking about starting a business, it's a, it's a tough road, uh, and the, what the data shows that not everyone is successful. Uh, you know, the odds are against the motivated people to want to open up their own businesses. Uh, what this slide and data shows is that from the Small Business Association and Bureau of Labor Statistics, half of the businesses nationally uh, that open up fail within the first five years, and uh, two-thirds uh, fail within ten. I mean. That's sobering, you know, it's sobering. It's not easy. So you got to hit it right out of the gate and then you got to be able to sustain to be successful. But the old model uh, isn't of economic development, wasn't addressing uh, all of the current challenges that our small and micro and alternative startup businesses face. So uh, the city and our economic development division began thinking creatively about, you know, how to address really what we're calling our modern uh, economic development needs. And so we're working in many ways to counter these challenges, and I'm going to give you, try to give you a window into three broad examples of what our alternative economic development uh, looks like uh, really in action, and starting with a closer look at some of the ways we uh, try to connect customers uh, to small local business while also uh, supporting that, uh, that local and, and diverse economy. So here's one example on the arts, should be of no surprise. Uh, some of us known and loved for its strength in yachts. People flock here from all over the region and other parts of the country to be part of our local and cultural events. But when the Arts Council hosts some cool event like Artbeat or, or Ignite or Honk we did recently, it's not just an opportunity for us to have a great Saturday or Sunday in the square. For me, it kind of is. I love it. But we did some study on this. And what is the impact when we do that, besides what we can obviously see? And an independent research firm that we hired in, uh, found that for every one dollar we spend, every one dollar we invest on festivals, on murals, and cultural events, what we see is a return of four dollars and forty cents in economic impact. So, how does that work? Uh, first, there are the direct benefits uh, to the artists and to the makers that we hire, and the businesses that the Arts Council pays for for supplies uh, like tents or maybe posters. Then some of these dollars obviously get spent again. Uh, locally by those artists and, and those businesses, recycle back into our local economy. And at the same time, as we know, these events, they draw some pretty big crowds of more than 20,000 people uh, down at Fluff. And I think what the figure was for Honk and all these other in Arpy. Uh, and those people, they visit the local shops. They eat here. Uh, and they buy art, so that brings in more economic activity. And finally, you know, the visitors at our events notice restaurants and services and either nonprofits to return to another day. And I remember, 
25 years ago when I started as a public official here, and we were talking about Union Square then, and I tried to help businesses who were struggling, some really cool restaurants at about 15 years before their time, and one of them said, you know what I would like, a really successful restaurant at the time said, what I would like is another successful restaurant next to me, another successful business next to them to create this sort of corridor of activity and energy, and we just couldn't hit it then. Um, so it's really important, but taking a closer look at how the events pump money into our local economy is also interesting. Uh, when that same research firm looked just at how the economic impact of our arts union program that we launched um, uh, back in 05 uh, in Union Square, uh, and we did this about a decade ago, the arts series was found uh, to be injecting roughly 200 to uh, $350,000 into Union Square annually. And to look back here at this slide, at event spending by the Arts Council the past five fiscal years, and we multiplied that conservatively by a factor of a, a four, not 4.4, that the researchers identified, shows that our citywide cultural and arts events have injected more than $3 million over five years, just right here into our local economy. So that's money, again, for artists, that's money for performers, uh, restaurants, uh, small businesses, and, and a lot more. But I also want to come back to something we alluded to, this idea of, uh, of placemaking. You, you may have heard of this. And I think we'd all agree that people want to stick around and be in places where they, they feel comfortable, they feel connected, and we strive to make them comfortable with activities, with outdoor furniture, appealing open spaces, and as we just discussed, with these really uh, cool events. So there's some interesting data of the impact on just some improvements we made in the last few years in Kenny Park. Everybody know what Kenny Park is? It's when you're coming from Highland Ave into Davis, that's the, la that's the park on your left right before the square. Um, and when we do, this shows that when we do placemaking, we see results in a Kenny Park in Davis Square. After we uh, fixed the water feature and we added those movable chairs, what we saw was 40% uh, more people just sitting in the park. So what we saw were parents, more parents just watching their kids play. Uh, we saw, uh, and by the day, more couples at night uh, on dinner dates in the evening just hanging out with their friends. So that in turn, you know, brings that sort of concentration activity in the square to help businesses, but it also builds another form of capital, that social equity and capital being connected to one another as a community. So we're not just these blurred images of faces passing by in a motor vehicle. Because remember, those cars that are passing through the city every day, they're not stopping in Davis. They're not stopping down a part of circle. Any part of the city, they're spending their money here. They're taking up the public right away. And, I, and that's when I said we need to think about how do we create a city at the human scale where people are all connected to one another, supporting the community, and uh, again, building that social equity and that uh, social capital. Um, some more data like cultural events. Uh, studies have found that when communities improve pedestrian and cycling infrastructure, they gain net new businesses. This is a fact. I've seen this data for years out of Brooklyn's and other places. Uh, and we also find that as a result, private investment increases and customers spend more for the reasons I just narrated for you. That's because, again, when you drive, many people will just speed by, but pedestrians and cyclists, uh, they do stop. Uh, they stop, they notice the businesses, and they actually become customers. Uh, dedicated bus lanes like the one we just put up on Broadway are part of this as well because the ridership increases and people are walking by those businesses. All right, to get to the buses, so you get more people again walking in that corridor. Uh, data supporting this point, uh, this was um, a study out of Portland, Oregon, uh, and it shows that cyclists and pedestrians have spent more per month uh, because they stop more often at local businesses. And we've seen this over the years as we've built up that biking and walking infrastructure, why we're going to continue to do more to meet our climate change goals, our public health goals, our quality of life, but also our local economy. But next, um, as we uh, head near the end here, I want to look at how we address equity and what we're doing to address equity and barriers and, uh, to entry into our local economy. Uh, so opening a business, as we've seen before, it's not easy. It takes a lot of work and there are some barriers to entry that can and actually do keep people locked out. I already mentioned some like not having access to capital or funds to cover the overhead or startup costs or having to figure out all that red tape but there are also, for instance, uh, language barriers, or it may be hard finding the right space in the city and being able to afford it, or having all the necessary skills and training to handle all the parts of the business. I might have this great idea, but 
how do I operationalize it? How do I make it work? The idea might be great, but am I going to run my business properly and be successful? And that, re and that requires a sort of access to education or, or on-the-job training. And we see how this has played out uh, for some groups from census data. The majority of businesses are all uh, are male owned here and, uh, in Somerville. And minorities only own a very small part, 18% uh, of the businesses in Somerville. So we need to ask why. You know, what are the variables that are driving that result? And what can we influence and what we can impact? Uh, but some of these barriers are also long standing, it should be no surprise, and uh, systemic. A uh, study of wealth in Boston found that white households in the area uh, had a median net worth of nearly a quarter of a million dollars, while African American households had a median net worth of only eight dollars. Again, what kind of impact um, can this have? Well, for one, uh, just think and look at uh, how people typically fund the small business startup. Many actually use credit cards or home equity. Uh, and you can see this would be a challenge for minority entrepreneurs. That's one reason we made equity, I'm looking through the a lens of equity, a key qualifier for uh, one of our new segments of our business community, the recreational marijuana license. And we looked at who had been most impacted uh, by the war on drugs. Another example of how we're thinking about how we get over these barriers is what we did in the Nibble program. And this is, again, one attempt at lowering the barriers specifically for immigrant entrepreneurs. Immigrants, um, all the data shows are twice as likely to start, uh, bless you, a business as uh, U.S. born residents, uh, but can run into, uh, you know, roadblocks around things that shouldn't be surprised, language barriers, again, startup cost, navigating and permitting uh, the certification, pro navigating and permitting and all that certification processes. So the Arts Council, Nibble program, what it does, it helps. Uh, immigrant entrepreneurs deal with that red tape. It offers support in other languages and it helps them organize uh, low overhead events uh, like pop-ups and lending at festivals. And these two I'll uh, mention in a second. She, if you've been to a lot of these festivals, you've probably seen them there. So two permanent businesses have grown out of it. One is Las Carolinas in a nibble kitchen at Bow Market. So far, we've had chefs and cooks from 13 different countries have benefited uh, from this program. Uh, so the the Division of Economic Development offers similar supports for businesses and other industries uh, at their one-stop uh, shop events where businesses network, uh, owners can get help with permits and licenses, get help in other languages, and understand best practices as well. Um, sometimes lowering the barriers to launch a business uh, or uh, barriers to entry means looking at our own rules and regulations here in the city and updating them to be in sync with current businesses, because much like how all our behavior has changed, obviously businesses' behavior has changed and their needs have changed over time. So one area, for example, we did this was in liquor licenses. And this is important because Somerville is consistently in the rankings of some of the best restaurants and the best of Boston, in the Boston area. That's because we have, I think, the largest concentration of local or independently owned and managed establishments. That was accomplished the greatest thing we did to help that result was how liquor licenses were distributed in the city. It used to be the old system where if you four people had a restaurant, say 20 years ago, and you had a liquor license, although you don't own the liquor license in Massachusetts, you possess the privilege of having it, and you possess the privilege of selling that privilege to someone else at a fair market value. So if I wanted to, you wanted to go out of business, you could sell me that license if the license commission approved. But it drove this false marketplace because that fair market value went up here. And you see this playing out in Boston right now. In the city of Boston, if you want to open up a restaurant and you want to get a liquor license, you're going to pay close to a half million dollars. So think about it. I'm a small business, but I'm an entrepreneur. I have a great idea. I'm going to shell out $500,000 before I even get into concept and design in my business plan. And we saw this uh, evolving in Somerville where we saw our license hit about $200,000 about 10 years ago. And that wasn't a play because at the time we couldn't spot new, a lot of new restaurants outside of Davis Square. So we were able to expand a few times, we've done this, our allotment of licenses. It's done under Mass General Laws, which is outdated, but still we're able to do this. And all the new licenses came in, we changed the rules that though you four could actually, if, you, if your new business is coming in, as long as you met the minimum requirements and all the other parameters, you'd get your license. And then when you're out of it, when you, if you decide to sell your business, you don't want to be anymore, the license is going back to the city and you just pay a nominal fee to us every year. 
And that's, I can tell you examples, Casa B, Union Square, Bronwyn, and many, many more. Uh, who wouldn't have opened up if they had to you know, pay up a couple hundred thousand dollars in business? That's worked well. Food trucks has been another area as well, you know, low and low startup costs, eliminating the need uh, for the right real estate, and again, updating our regulations to allow them, and we continuously look at this. There's a food truck, whether it's food truck or the dining in concept, a lot of the cool restaurants in Sumble, there's a bunch of their examples, they started that way. You know, they tested their concept in a dining in concept. Uh, the, is it the, you know, they just did a write up about um, Peter's place down at a, a serving counter, the tasting counter, was it down in uh, Aeronaut? Yeah, anyway, but he started in dining in and so did in Casa B. And so that we want to make sure we give those people the idea to test their concept in action and develop their business plan, and it's working out well. Um, the third area, again, that we'll look at is how economic development efforts are striving to keep up with who, uh, how people are working. So the way people work has changed, not just the way people run their business or think about starting a business. Uh, there are about 5.6 uh, million small and micro businesses in the United States, and 89% of them have fewer than 20 employees. And these small shops still need office, lab, or manufacturing space, but might not uh, want uh, be able to afford their own space. Um, we look at supporting co-working and incubated spaces where those companies can begin and helping them find uh, new spaces in some as they mature and as they grow. I'll give you two examples. Green Town Labs is the largest um, clean tech uh, incubator in North America, soon to be the world. Um, they have 120 uh, businesses have used the space. They started here uh, five, six years ago with about 25 years ago with 25 businesses. Um, some like L3, Voxelate, Right Hand Robotics, which grew and moved into the old post office, and Union Square is about to grow again and stay in Somerville, which we're excited about. Uh, they've created 900 jobs in the city, and we helped them out with our innovation fund, the loan fund, a grant, which in return for that job creation, they've hit it out of the park. So we, uh, so we helped them with that, find them the right space, we supported their expansion. And again, they have a success story we're really proud of because some of them wants to be the climate solution capital of the world. And we want these ideas to be springing here, but we're asking ourselves what keeps these businesses here. Funny story is when I first came in office in 1996, I went to a chamber of commerce dinner that year, and we gave a new business, the new innovative business award went to iRobot. Anybody know who iRobot is? They got the award, three days later they moved out of the city. No one asked them, hey, what are you doing here? <laughs> what would it take to stay here? It was just this smart group of uh, college students that started at the Twin City Plaza on the second floor. Came up with this cool idea, now it's a, you know, I'm gonna have to tell you how successful that company is. The other example is um, Artisans Asylum. We did ask them when they started off down in the brick bottom here, what are you guys doing here? What, you know, how, what, is, what is driving this uh, fabrication making artisan movement? sort of a, an embracing of, the, of our country's manufacturing roots with a sort of modern flavor on it. Uh, they are one of the world's largest maker spaces and like Greentown, they, they offer alternative workspace. And Addison calculates that uh, they've uh, had about a total of $30 million in local econ uh, economic impact. Um, but they didn't succeed in Somerville by chance. Uh, city staff to help them locate and sign a lease and stay here in Somerville. And we worked on various programs uh, um, and partnerships with artisans and with the individual members. And we donated them, used um, some of the high school um, machining equipment, uh, as well as we've included provisions in our new zoning overhaul. We've learned from what we, how we can enable collaborative creativity with these spaces. So in our new zoning overhaul, on the proposal that's under consideration by the city council, fabrication districts, uh, are designated areas are there to preserve those types of spaces with large floor plates and create, again, uh, you create this bump factor, you put a lot of interesting weird people together and you know, magic sort of happens and it's, it's really fascinating to see that. But we're also working to draw and support other new ways of working. We looked at our own regulations for home-based businesses and changed those so it's easy for people to work at home. We've also adopted artists and make a friendly zoning and economic development has, has expanded their program beyond Beyond the traditional brick and mortar programs, a focus 20 years ago was like, how do we do storefront improvement, help you improve your facade and your doorway and your store, but we, we flipped that upside down. Right now we offer uh, an active entrepreneur network where small business owners and uh, self-employed people get together to network and uh, share advice and best practices. And between 75 to 80% of member businesses are women and or are minority owned. So we like, we like how that's, we're, we're utilizing the lens of equity and inclusion to have success. 
So you've heard about some of the things the city is doing in support of small businesses, but it's also worth pointing out that all of us as consumers have power here too. So when we spend locally, uh, we're actually investing in some of all. That's not just a phrase. Uh, that is true when you shop locally. A greater percentage of what you spend stays local and can you, continues to help some of all. Local businesses hire people in the community. They often are sponsoring some sort of youth group or program uh, or partnering with our schools. They get supplies locally and hire contractors and uh, whether it's to do their electrical work or maybe set up their website. So this chart, uh, for example, shows that when you shop at a chain retailer, about an estimated or approximate 13.6%, 14 on the slide, of your dollars spent recirculates back in the local economy. But when you shop at an independent local retailer, nearly half those dollars, half, it's a big difference, uh, funneled back in the community as, again, owners and spa staff are proven to spend locally. Uh, our local businesses uh, and our entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs face challenges and we're working on all fronts to support them. But one of the positive indicators of the growth of this diversity of our, of our, of our economic base, how it's increased just from 2012 alone to 2018, the number of net new businesses has increased roughly 23%. That's about 489 new businesses. And most of these are uh, small or micro businesses. That means less than five employees, including the owner. But this is important because we put a major focus on this about 15 years ago, we, we got away from hunting elephants, as they would say. We'd be, by that I mean going to Kendall Square somewhere else, telling the company, we need you to come to Sumble. And we still do that. Uh, we're trying to attract that, that major player, but we wanted to support and grow an evolving, diverse economic base that creates the next best thing, like climate solution and what's happened in Addison. And it's really fascinating to watch. Again, uh, you know, cumulatively, these small businesses, they're the economic engine supporting really who we are here and some of what we're trying to accomplish. So that's where I'm going to end. Um, but I just remind ourselves, this is not a spectator uh, sport. Uh, their success has been our uh, loyal to our local businesses, our loyalty there, and I appreciate that. They appreciate that. Um, that's all I'm going to say right now, but I'm going to take a couple of questions before I hand off to Brad Lawson. Interesting. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, do you want to answer that question? Did you hear it? Entrepreneur Network and, the, and what we're doing for supporting uh, home-based businesses? Um, for the Somerville Entrepreneur Network, there's an email newsletter list that you can sign on to. It's available on our website under the Economic Development section. You can also check in with me on your way out the door, and I'm happy to add you to the list for that. Don't forget to introduce yourself. They want to know. Oh, you. right. I'm Lauren Drago. Uh, so I work in economic development, and part of my job is supporting the small businesses and a lot of the initiatives that uh, the mayor we spoke to. Um, and what was your other question? Um, the zoning for home office for I'm less familiar with that. So, yeah, I'll connect you to the planning department in terms of what we're doing within, the, within our regulations to support that. Great, so we can connect to the Yeah. Oh, I'm also a Ward 7 resident. More importantly, so yes. <laughs> Only Ward 7 employees are allowed to come here and speak tonight per order of the council from Ward 7. It was not. Melissa? Oh, scape. I think you said state. Scape. No, scape, yeah. I'm going to right. summarize for those who might not know the issue. So there was a land transaction, and it's the block where the Burren, McKinnons, Sligo, if I miss anybody, you pissed at me, Ryan Pizza or not, yeah. So, uh, but local, part of the that eclectic diversity, some local businesses have been there a while, some not, been, and important to the city and the community. So the owner of the building, uh, sold the property to a company called SCAPE, S-C-A-P-E, and they were bought with the intention of proposing um, 
dormitory rooms or student housing uh, you see cropping up in a lot of urban areas around the globe. I think they're out of the UK. All that's happening right now is there was a land transaction. Uh, there's a meeting tonight. They have not formally uh, presented any plans to the city. As we said to them, there's a few things we're concerned about. One, we made it clear there'll be a very stringent community process and there's gonna be a lot of concerns. And here's some of the concerns the city said to them. Whether it's Scape or a hotel or a tech company or something one of you want to build above that block, we would say the mix and diversity of business is important to us and must be maintained. Um, and I think they heard that loud and clear. Now, I'm not so sure that project will move forward. So it remains to be seen. All that's happened is a land transaction. We can't help the transaction. We've been very upfront with them, our concerns, and we won't speak for the community. I said I can bet this is what Phil said. Um, so we'll see if that moves forward. But it, in terms of, let's say something else goes in there. Uh, I believe that, because I know State would have uh, had understood that they would have to offer fair market, below fair market value rent to those entities to keep them there. Uh, one of the challenges we would have, because there's nothing above them now, is the disruption time of a business. Because even if you can make the fair market, the rent work for folks, the community, if you shut your business down for a year and you have no place to, ramping it back up, you just can't flip a switch. It takes time, so that's something we're already thinking about because whether it's state or something else that we might, let's just say it's another project that we all love. It's gonna be a challenge for us um, to figure that out. Can yes? I, let me just say something, which is that I think it's wonderful that all these businesses are coming in. I think it's wonderful that these lovely people who are now my neighbors are my neighbors. <laughs> but there's a character here that we all love and we want to preserve and we want to, we have to really pay attention to the balance of that. Yeah, yeah. The only thing we like about Kendall Square is their money. We'll take that in the we'll city, but we don't like anything else. Yeah. No, I think, and, and that's important because I think we do something. What's important what we do in Somerville, and it doesn't really happen in us. Everything has been part of a collaborative community conversation. It's not easy. We don't always agree with everything, um, and uh, but we historically land in a spot unified on a set of shared community values and maintaining the character diversity, not just the people living here, but the economic basis and part of that. Uh, and we're really excited by that. Um, we agree. We don't want to be kind of, again, go back to the restaurants. I have nothing, I, I do frequent some chains, I'll admit that sin, but there are some I like. I'm sure we all do that. But I, 90% I, of my meals, even more of that, are here in some of the local based restaurants. I think that makes us really unique. The question is, who had, if, we, if you start a business here, do you get to participate in that future economy? And how? Uh, just like if, you know, can we, on the housing, can we really offer you an authentic choice to rent or buy here? How do we accomplish that? Uh, and I think the good, the one thing is we all, we all have that in our laser focus, so I appreciate that. Um, on, the, on the escape thing, I would say we're very early on. Uh, I, I, yeah, so we'll see what happens there. I'm gonna hand off, I'm not going anywhere. Oh, I'll take one more question, okay. You had your hand up. Yeah. The pit, we need to call it by the right name. It's been called a pit by Ward Did they all know? So I understand that there's contamination there. Yeah. Now, seeping is So the, the question is the hole in the ground, the pit, where there's a proposed hotel uh, in there dealing with some remediation issues. I haven't got the update, Laura, do you have that? Yep. Update, yes, please. Um, so the, as many of you know, I think you've been involved in a lot of the neighborhood meetings on this, there is a proposal to put a hotel on that site. Um, and the idea behind that use and the density of that use is that it could potentially cover the cost of remediation. Um, and so that is moving forward. They got the approval for their variances that they needed to move forward with the project. However, part of the complexity of the environmental contamination means that it takes a little bit longer to work with the banks to start that process. So they actually recently just um, went in for it and got approved for an extension to their variance. So the work is continuing, although I appreciate it, it doesn't really look like it right now. Um, one of the conditions on that approval is that they're gonna keep cleaning out the property so that it will at least have a little bit less trash in it. Um, but that project is moving forward and part of the requirements of that ultimately being developed is that they would have to do the environmental research and the remediation for what's actually going on. So they have a little bit of information, but not everything yet, and we'll know more as the project continues. Is there any 
So if I could just give an update. So I spoke to the property owner today in anticipation because he couldn't make it here this evening. So they submitted their building permit on September 20th. Um, they had a meeting with the city today to make sure that everything was in place. They expect probably in the next 10 days to actually get that permit. After they get the permit, then they will have to uh, go through the, the state EPA process. Um, uh, no one has ever said anything about seeping into. Nobody knows because there hasn't been uh, that amount of thoroughness in terms of testing the grounds hasn't been done. There will be a community meeting, um, probably in November and December that I will host, I'll host it here, that we'll talk about uh, the whole construction phase and what to expect and, and, the, and the process. But in terms of the direct question, is, is contamination seeping into the ground? Um, no one has ever said that because it's never been tested for, so I'm not sure where, yeah. where that language came from. Yeah, uh, and I'm going to end there, but so he is, a, he is a local resident, local business owner, and we're happy about that. But in any of these cases where there's contamination, they're very, and that's why it takes longer, uh, and for good reason, work with the environmental agencies, and there'll have to be a lot of data reports based on how that's remediated and so forth. Again, I'm not going anywhere, but uh, just so we stay on time, I respect your time. Uh, Brad Ross is up next. Am I right? All right. Brad will talk about some uh, transportation and uh, mobility issues. Thanks, Mayor. And thanks, everybody. Great crowd. I personally appreciate the ability to sit in normal seats rather than all crowding into the, to the kiddo seats. Um, hi, Brad Ross, and I know so many of you. I live up the block on West Adams Street. Uh, proud public servant and resident of this great city for 12 years. And with me is my right hand, Mr. Adam Polinski. Adam, want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, formerly Ward 4, I just moved to Ward 6 a couple months ago, resident. Uh, I'm the transportation analyst for the city, uh, and I work under Brad. So, you know, we could talk about 100 different things. Our team are the mayor's point people on the Green Line Extension. Our team are the mayor's point people on MBTA bus modernization. Our team are the point people on neighborhood traffic calming, bicycle and pedestrian safety planning, a certain amount of parking policy. We actually also do parks and urban forestry, uh, so it's just kind of super fun. Um, and we're actually working on the uh, West Somerville Neighborhood Schoolyard with Councillor Ballantyne and so many of you. Tonight's focus is on mobility and on our safe streets agenda. So before we talk about the elephant in the room in Powderhouse Boulevard, um, we actually wanted to kind of warm up the, um, uh, the conversation a little bit. So back in 2017, the mayor asked our staff to modify certain regulations in the city. You have the right, I have the right as a Somerville resident to petition your local government to evaluate your street. There are too many cars, they're moving too darn fast. We know this all over our four square miles. And so we collected a bunch of data, Adam. Remember, this was one of the ones that actually stood out to us back in 2017, 2018, right? Yeah, there are about 30 streets that we uh, had petitions submitted for, uh, and we were kind of new to the data collection business and really trying to understand the best way uh, to figure out how cars were moving around Somerville and really how to prioritize the most dangerous locations. Um, and Cameron Ave stood out as one of those streets, and uh, the you know the average speed was almost 30 miles per hour, and that that you know on Somerville streets it's particular residential ones, it's closer to 20 or 25, but Cameron rose to the top of that list and that was concerning for us. Any folks here live on Cameron, Mead, uh, the Hill Streets off there? Such a cool little neighborhood, Elmwood. Okay, we're well represented in my side of the neighborhood. So, you know, Cameron in, in some ways does feel like an underappreciated hazard in the community. And one of the cool things is that, you know, like the mayor said, we're not Cambridge, we're not made of money. It's not the 1970s and 1980s anymore. Our city is on sounder financial footing than we've ever been after 15 years of fiscal stewardship. However, we don't have the ability to go cut streets up and install curb extensions and speed humps everywhere. Often that means you're moving drainage structures around. So one of our primary toolkits, the way we can be as responsive as possible, is by, believe it or not, putting paint down on the street. And we've done research project after research project after research project showing that a few hundred dollars, a few thousand dollars of pavement markings can slow the cars down. Yeah, and one of the things that we've been able to do is sort of tackle two birds with one stone. Um, when we have the width and we can provide some additional infrastructure for people who choose to bike around the city, we also narrow the travel lanes. Uh, a lot of Somerville's wider major streets are about 40 feet wide, which with two seven foot parking lanes, 
gives you about 12 or 13 foot travel lanes. Uh, and that is way more than anyone needs to drive. And in fact, when you see lanes that wide and have a straight shot like you do on camera nav, it makes you want to drive faster and people do tend to drive faster and that's when we run into issues. So um, by narrowing those travel lanes and pr providing some additional infrastructure uh, for people who aren't driving, uh, you're, you're sort of addressing multiple things in a much more affordable fashion than we could if we were doing more typical things like reconstructing uh, the concrete bump outs or, or changing the elevation of the street with, by speed bumps or things like that. Now don't get us wrong, this is still an alarming number, but the trends are moving in the right direction. Which brings us to the boulevard itself. So again, so many of you have been involved in all of our hard work on calming traffic on the boulevard. So back in 17, uh, when you all asked us to begin the evaluation process, we are getting ready to do water work, we are getting ready to do gas work, we are getting ready to bring the sidewalks into ADA compliance and repave the street. And so obviously it was a, a really kind of detrimental condition and we went out and we collected some data, right Adam? Yeah. Yeah, and um, we, what we were able to do was we were able to put down these tubes at one location so that we could have an apples to apples comparison of what cars were doing, uh, particularly right around the school. And what we were able to find that the, the more we did, um, the more we were able to actually influence speeds in a really substantial way. So even before Allison's crash, you know, we went out and we actually striped some new fire lanes and some new crosswalks. And in fall of 2018, um, we found, uh, you know, again, we put the tubes down and we found that that number of daily motor vehicles, about 10,000 cars, uh, was kind of sticky and stubborn and stuck. Um, but we had actually dropped the speeds to about, you know, 42% illegal speeding. After Allison's crash, as we all know, the city of Somerville went out and we put a bunch of flex posts on the street uh, within a day or two. And, and again, we are still bearing the burden of that crash. But we went out and we measured once again and we were able to knock that number down just a little bit more. The interesting thing at that time was that people were still choosing to pass through our neighborhood for 10,000 cars a day. That's a ton. So I'm really pleased to report that here we are in October 2018. We've just collected some new data in the back to school season. And after this combination of three things, you know, the speed humps obviously are, are, are the big ticket item and the real influencing factor here. But we don't want to discount the narrow travel lanes that Adam was talking about on Cameron Avenue and the four-way stop, which we'll talk about in a moment. This is all part of a strategy that we've worked to communicate with you and your neighbors around, okay? So, hallelujah. Fewer than 1% of the motor vehicles outside this school are speeding. This is a really big deal, folks. This is much more successful than we ever could have imagined. But there's another kind of hidden victory here. We've made it so hard for people who don't need to drive here to drive here, that they're stopping driving here. <laughs> Isn't that one of our objectives? Yes, I, I feel it is. That's what I hear from parents in the school. That's what I hear from our neighbors, our uh, institutions in the faith-based community. So is our work done? No, far from it. Oh, come now. Okay, um, so we will make sure that we have some time to talk about people's perspectives and user experience with the four-way stop conversion. We communicated with you all about the pros and the cons of this decision, and we are very clear that this is a pilot. This is an experimental city. We are determined to do more with less, and we are courageous enough to admit it when our experiments don't get the results that we want. So we're in testing phase right now. Um, so Adam, why don't you talk through a little bit about uh, this, this experiment? Sure. So um, one thing that we were doing is we were trying to figure out how to build a comprehensive safety plan for the boulevard, knowing that pedestrian safety was our priority, um, was to look at the intersections, which is traditionally where most crashes occur, particularly for pedestrians. Uh, and to investigate that question, we looked at what we could potentially do uh, at Curtis Street, at Packard, at North Street. And one of the suggestions uh, that, and one of the things that we came up with in consultation uh, with one of our local engineering firms is that we believe that uh, piloting a four-way stop at the, this intersection um, was something that could potentially increase safety because rather than having someone mash on the gas when they get a yellow light and someone walking on the street not seeing that person, you really slow the intersection down and you um, prevent some of those really dangerous speeding behaviors. Uh, so what we did was we made sure that we had all of the crosswalks in order. We actually moved the one on the Curtis Street uh, north side closer to the intersection to make that a more reasonable crossing location to allow vehicles to get a little bit closer and have better sight lines. Uh, we put up some stop signs and we bagged them. 
Um, and then we put up some new uh, speed boards and signs on posts to let pedestrians and drivers know that this was coming. And then we went out on a Friday in late August. Uh, we bagged the signals. We took the signs off the stop signs. Um, and we started our trial. So we're in about month three now, um, and we're continuing to evaluate and are looking at a number of things, the most obvious being crash rate and how many crash reports we get about this intersection. One of the alarming things um, about this compared to Packard Ave, for example, which is also a four-way stop, is that even when you consider that Packard Ave is a slightly less busy intersection, it's still performing considerably better and there are much fewer crashes at that location when you look at the crash history over the last five years. And we really believe that we're going to see similar things with Curtis Street. So this is again an experiment. This is a work in progress. We are collecting data and user experience and actual resident perspectives matter to us. So we're collecting the numbers and we respect and honor your feedback and we know that people have different opinions about that. So I'll be happy to take a couple of questions, please. So, Yep, so good question, thank you, appreciate that. Camera, we're up there for a couple of days. Uh, we're now processing the data. We will be evaluating the number, the number of... This is helpful. Duly noted. Thank you. Appreciate all those comments. I'll take a couple of more, but folks, we are studying these issues. We are collecting the data, and again, we will modify this plan as we go forward. Jessica, please. Thanks, I appreciate that. And just so folks know, our work is not done, whether it's here at the school, uh, whether it's over by Triangle Field and the Rotary, 
or over by Route 16, and, and your point is a, is a good one, we're still super, super worried about all of the residents in our neighborhood who want to access Dillboy Pool, who want to access the ball fields, the boardwalk that Katiana mentioned. Um, those are high speed you know, geometries that encourage fast driving. Um, so we're working with the DCR, which controls that roadway. Jim, please. I walk my grandchildren to this school multiple times during the week. Uh, in the morning, that is, has to be one of the dangerous intersections, both for kids and for the crossing guards. I've my, my grandson almost got hit last week, and uh, putting two crossing guards did help, but I've watched cars think they met their obligations by stopping. And then they start, and the crossing guard goes out for kids, and the car's going behind them, and the kids are crossing. You're relying on four drivers making the correct call, whereas one red light makes everybody, it's understandable. Uh, the bike lane and the narrowing, it's a danger, I think, both to bikes and drivers. I walk five miles a few times a week. I'm up and down the boulevard a few times. I saw very few bikes on it before this whole thing went down. Most of the time they're crossing the Broadway, and I assume towards Davis Square. But never did I really see anybody going up and down. And I was on the boulevard three different times during that walk. But the bike path is seven feet wide, whereas the others are about half that. So I watch cars. Five, five feet. Is okay. standard? I watch cars driving half in the bike lane and half in the street, and I think that in itself doesn't help anybody, whether it be drivers or bikers. Uh, and I will say on a positive note, I like the bike lane next to the curb, like in front of Trump Field, and the parking out because I don't have to worry about driving out and running into a bicyclist or opening my door. So that is the positive. But we've got to have some consistency, too, because no matter where you drive in the city, it's a different path. And until people get used to consistency, they're going to make mistakes, and someone's going to get hurt. Good points all, Jim. Thank you. Um, so just for kind of respect of everybody's time, we've got a couple other speakers. I'll take one or two more questions, and we'll make one or two more comments. Um, but just to address a couple of the things that we heard. And, and folks, there is no perfect answer here. Managing traffic is generally a series of choices between bad and worse. And one of the things that we have been trying to do with this four-way conversion is reduce high-speed crashes. When a motor vehicle is moving at 20 or 25 or 30 miles per hour, as they often are when they're catching a green or when they're violating a red at high speeds, that's when you have terrible consequences. And I'm not minimizing that when somebody's making a turning movement at five miles per hour or 10 miles per hour, it's not scary or uncomfortable. These are the questions that we are trying to weigh as public safety professionals ourselves. So I totally hear what you're saying. And anybody else who feels similarly, know that we are listening and evaluating and will make changes as appropriate. Adam, do you want to add anything about the, about the four-way stop before I address Jim's question about uh, the bike lane? Uh, nope, you said it perfectly. OK. so. Jim's point about the bike lane, we have had community process, we have had many people advocating for the next phase of work. And just to kind of jump forward, we will be working with Councilor Ballantyne on scheduling the next community meeting about the next phase of the Rotary uh, and the Section Year Triangle Field in the University. And Jim, to your point, the reason that we selected a seven foot wide bike lane there was because we were hearing from stakeholders in the community that they wanted to preserve the ability to float that parking out, and you got this long, unbroken stretch of curb here with no driveways and curb cuts. The parking lane's seven feet, the bike lane's seven feet, and because we had this you know, community process that was underway, we felt that in good faith, we would preserve the ability to easily do that if the community process pushed us towards that solution. So again, I just wanted to address that. Um, Laura, I saw you had a question, and I'll come here, sir, please. Yeah, um, and my question might be for you and might be for the mayor. Um, but we see you, per I've seen you do this presentation a number of times, um, and we have seen, um, you know, you had this toolbox of solutions that you say are fast and quick and cheap. And in this city, we know that there are dozens of intersections that are dangerous. I'm sure in this room, we could name 20 in Ward 7 that are dangerous and need improvements. And what I want to know is we have all these quick, safe, or these quick, easy, cheap ways to improve intersections. And we have this staff of people who care very deeply about it. Um, why aren't you empowered to make those changes? 
Well, Laura, I appreciate the question. Let me say, as a resident, as the city's chief transportation planner, I am empowered. Adam is empowered. Mayor Joe, Chief Fallon, President Ballantyne, give us the room to run, and we do aggressive work as quickly as humanly possible. We've got great interdepartmental partners. Rich Rach is here. His team was responsible for managing the speed hump construction, which is a little bit out of our wheelhouse, right? So I actually feel like we are giving great latitude and license to try and experiment and try to deliver more safe streets interventions faster. I do feel like we're the envy of many of our peer communities, but I hear you. We are dealing with 50 years worth of legacy infrastructure that prioritize speeding motor vehicles through urban environments. And it's taking us you know, 15 uh, years, right, Mayor, to make some of the progress that we've made. And we know we've got another generation's worth of work. So I, I respect where you're coming from. And so I'll, I'll come back to you. But Joe, do you want to say anything on that? No, I, I would just say on, I, I'm sorry, I was just, just a comment. On the funding side, there's no inhibition up on it. There's no limitation. Uh, we're trying to get it right. Uh, it's also an adaptive challenge for a lot of the community. We want to bring people along because it's, it's not about one intersection or one road, this sort of roadway. We want to be the most bikeable, walkable, safest city to travel by any mode, even in a motor vehicle in, in the Commonwealth and be a model of the country. So I hear you. Um, so there, it's, it'd be a, it's a worse situation if we don't have the money to do these things. And it could be frustrating. We, got to, we have enough money to do it than we're going to do. So, But everybody has to own the work, okay? Uh, going back to just getting how long it took to get Beacon Street done. I'm not talking about the construction to get people along for a, the first federally funded cycle track on Beacon Street. It was no easy task. So uh, I think we all need to understand the value benefit of what we're trying to create here. Right. And, and Laura, one last comment, then it comes to you, sir. I apologize for keep you waiting. Um, so we're working through a strategic planning process. Many of you have been involved trying to bring the same kind of prioritization to these intersections and streets, the same way that Rich has done with our capital projects, our libraries, our school buildings, our sewer pipes. We have these asset management frameworks. Heck, our trees. When I talked about our urban forestry program. We've dragged our urban forestry program with great support from President Ballantyne and others into the modern era. We will actually know where tree failure in the bad windstorm like happened last week is perhaps more likely and we get ahead of these issues. Um, we are so eager to, to kind of bring that predictability for so many neighbors who again share our vision of making our streets slower and safer. Right at 215 Potter House Boulevard. And, um, you know, I appreciate that we're slowed the cars down for the school. I think it's great. But the cars have not slowed down down toward North Street. They're still coming up off of 16, 40, 45 miles an hour, and they're hitting the speed bump. And I sat out there Sunday night, all right, for an hour, 23 cars bottomed out over that speed bump. They don't see the speed bump. There's no signage that there's a speed bump there, and it's it's really a problem. We we really we are not able to enjoy the porches any longer. You hear that laying in bed at night. Um, it, it's a problem. No, thanks, Steve. Oh. I appreciate that. The one other thing, the city truck. All right, the city truck went over that speed bump, like 35, 40 miles an hour. Barrel came flying out of the out of the truck, almost hit me. So it's not just like it's not just cars. It's it's a problem. It's something I'll talk with our DPW commissioner about tomorrow, Steve. And, and you know, I hear what you're saying. Uh, more pavement markings and signage is needed, uh, and additional traffic calming measures as well down closer to, to Route 16. Um, so. We hear you, we're on it. Okay. So last but not least, no, no meeting here would be complete without just updating you for several Resistat cycles in a row. We've talked about Powderhouse Rotary. We are working with a third party engineer and preparing uh, plans. More community meetings will come. Again, we recognize that that is a barrier to movement for so many people, whether you're driving, biking, walking, uh, et cetera. So more to come on that, folks. Um, out of respect for everybody's time, I'm going to hand it over to Chief Fallon. Adam and I are going to stick around, and we'll be happy to talk with you afterwards. Keep the faith, folks. We are truly working every day to try to make our streets safer. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to uh, President Valentine for a moment to make an announcement.
So, hi, I forgot to mention, so I've heard from your representative, Christine Barber. She always attends these meetings, but she's up at the State House, so she couldn't. They have some votes, and they're going on late tonight. Councillor uh, Mary Jo Rossetti uh, is at the SCAPE meeting um, this night, tonight, and uh, your school committee rep, Carrie Norman, is at a forum. They all apologize they couldn't be here, but they had to be at those, those other events. Thank you. So I guess I'll stop introducing myself. I'm Chief David Fallon from the Police Department. This is Captain James Donovan. Um, I'm glad he's here tonight. He does a great job running our patrol division um, and a great job up here in Ward 7. Uh, crime, when we, when we speak about crime from our perspective of the police department, we talk about index crime. Uh, index crime is made up, uh, uh, com composed of crimes against persons and crimes against property. Um, citywide, index crime decreased 2% over one year and 3% over two years. Uh, Ward 7, the numbers are, are even better. Index crime decreased 19% over one year, 3% over two. Violent um, crime decreased 24% over one year and 13% over two years. Um, we have seen a small increase in selected property crimes, such as package thefts, and also over the last few weeks we've had us along with Cambridge have had numerous car breaks, with, uh, mostly Hondas, where uh, people are still on the earbags. So we'll take a look at that. We're trying to find out where they're being sold on the secondary market, but I think it's up to over 20 incidents we've had involving earbags. Um, this is a map similar that Captain Donovan would look at on a daily basis. Uh, look where crimes are occurring in the ward, talk to his offices, get him into those areas. Um, so what we're looking at, the bike theft, uh, we have seen an uptick in bike theft throughout the city, so we wanted to give you some takeaways. What we're hoping you do and also let you know what we're doing. We assigned a sergeant to oversee all the bike theft investigations prioritize suspect identification and bike recovery, analyze temporal and geographical patterns of incidents, neighborhood police officers and area cars deployed based on temporal patterns and hot spots, and in increase the res residents' awareness by giving you some of these take-home tips on the left. You know, I, we're aware in some of them, uh, you know, the command staff that policing sometimes, you know, nationally is looked through a, you know, a, a, a difficult lens at times in policing role in society is always looked at critically at times, and I think that's important. I think police departments have to provide the type and style of policing that the community demands, and I don't think a police department can be successful without community input, without buy-in from community. So myself as a chief, I want to ensure that, you know, we have, we have buy-in from the community. And this year, in the last couple of years, we've very focused on the youth of the community to have police officers interact with the youth totally in a non-law enforcement role. You know, they get to know the youth of the community as a person, not as a police officer, but a member of the, of the community, somebody that works in the community, because I believe being in policing in some of them for over 20 years that if your first interaction with somebody is a positive one, you get to know, know somebody on a human level, I think that every interaction after that can be positive. And as a police chief, that's what we really push down to our staff. Uh, the basketball clinic run by some of the police officers that attended some of the high school, played basketball at some of the high school, went on to play college basketball, they're back in the high school and they're one in the clinic, they just started another one during the school year. So, you know, very effective uh, as officers in a mentoring role. Junior Police Academy has become more and more popular. Uh, this year we held two one-week academies uh, with a total of 61 graduates. So officers interact with, with the youth and community and you see that they're vitally important, I think, for the success of policing. Summer Police Department was awarded accreditation by the Massachusetts Police Accreditation Commission on June 4th of 2019. It's the first time in the history of the Summer Police Department that we became an accredited police department. And it's really, it's not the norm for a department our size. It's very rare to see a, a department of some size become accredited. And what it says down below, it's a self-initiated evaluation process by which police departments strive to meet and maintain standards that have been established for the profession, for, for the profession by the profession. Um, the, these carefully selected standards reflect critical areas of police management, operations, technical support activities, and it covers areas such as policy development, emergency response planning, training, communications, property, 
evidence. So what we did is we revamped all our policies and procedures to really meet what we believe to be the gold standard in policing. I went through a self-assessment process where we evaluated our policies and procedures. Then we had a team of assessors come in from the um, Accreditation Commission, and they made sure that we were meeting those policies. After we did that, we received accreditation. We took those policies and we put them all online. So you go to the city website, you go to the police department, you can look at each one of our policies. And um, we ask you to do that. And, and if you have questions about them or concerns, and you say, look, it, we think this is how you should do it, we'll take that input. We'd love to have that conversation. You know, continue to, and, and continue to improve our policies in conjunction with the community. Um, substance misuse and mental health, so it's still a crisis. I mean, you know, what level the police we play in those crises is, is, is always a question to me, but I know as a police chief that at two o'clock in the morning, if somebody's family member is in, in a mental health crisis, the police get called. So we want to make sure that when our officers show up to that scene, they're trained, that they're empathetic, and their mindset is on de-escalation. De-escalation and not arrest. And how do I get this person in my community that's in need to services in our community. So four years ago, we, we developed the community outreach harm reduction program in Somerville. Now in the lobby of Somerville Police Department, we have two licensed clinical social workers, social workers that work with the police office, officers every day. We have a drug and alcohol counselor that works with the officers. So they look at all these calls, they talk to the officers about how to connect people to services in the community. And it's been very effective. Right now about, 70% of some of police officers have received 40 hours of training in crisis intervention. So how to recognize somebody with the disease of mental illness and how to work with that person and work with stakeholders, stakeholders in the community to get them assistance and out of the criminal justice system, probably the last place that they should be. So this last slide is some resources that we talked to the officers about that are present in the community and um, we wanted to give you that as a takeaway. But I can also take one or two questions before I pass off the microphone. That's great. So I appreciate your time here. Oh, I'm sorry. I almost got off. I should have. I should have jumped, but I didn't. Thanks. I just want to ask any statistics connecting to um, parties at Tufts with the students, and um, whether you know calling Tufts Police first or Somerville if you're not sure. You know, who do you call when you when you when you can't sleep? Sure. So actually, I'm going to turn this over to Captain Donovan, who works with Tufts on a daily basis. Uh, I do work with Tufts almost every day. Uh, call the Sunroad Police. Our policy in Sunroad Police is that uh, we're the responders in our city. Uh, we go to every single call within our city. Uh, even if Tufts gets the call from a resident, they call us. Uh, we're the responding officers. We also have Tufts at all our calls. So it's a multi-pronged approach. We go there, we handle it from our point of view, but Tufts goes there, they have to file a report, they give it to the administration, and the administration follows up with the student. A lot of times if we go there, you know, the, the students live in New Jersey or wherever they live, and they may give us the lip service that first time we go there, and not a lot we can do other than close the party down, but uh, when they go to school on, on Monday after the weekend, and they call up to the dean's office that afternoon, it's a, it's a little different. And at some point, mom and dad get notified. But we also, I work very closely with Tufts uh, every day, and also, um, I, you know, I work with the other administrations, uh, other departments in the, the city, uh, and special services, and we've taken care of at least three landlords in the city, and uh, in, in the Ward 7 area, who rent strictly to Tufts, who were absentee landlords. Uh, one of them evicted all their students mid-semester. Uh, the second one came right down from Arlington and, and grabbed, her, grabbed the students in her uh, apartment on Pottos Boulevard, had them in my office in suits with resumes. Um, and the third one, he owns multi-units on uh, College Ave, and I guarantee you uh, he has my number on speed dial. So we work very closely with Tufts. We've written more noise ordinance citations so far this year than we've probably written in five years. Uh, so we are all over the students. You know, they're going to party. Last week was uh, homecoming, uh, but we had officers out there. We work with Tufts. Tufts actually funded two officers uh, on Fridays and Saturday nights, two of our officers, paying our officers uh, strictly to handle noise complaints within the neighborhoods. Uh, so we are on top of it. Oh, go ahead, ma'am. Okay, hi. I just have something. I, we had recently a neighbor who was clearly somebody I don't, 
sorry, somebody I don't know who was clearly very upset. Um, I know about the best team, the behavioral mm -hmm. emergency team. Yeah. I called them directly, uh, and they said you should call the Somerville police. And I said, are they trained? And she said, yes, they're great. So I just wanted to give you that compliment. Oh, thank you very much. Great, very nice. Thank you. So moving on to the last portion of our presentation, we have um, Rich Rayshire, Director of Infrastructure and Asset Management. So, also a Ward 7 resident, so I, I, I think that makes a, a baker's dozen here. Uh, okay, so uh, Infrastructure and Asset Management is a new department that uh, we created this year because the city is taking seriously um, maintenance and upgrades to all of our municipal assets. Uh, Capital Projects Division is uh, running the West Branch Library renovation and the high school uh, building. Uh, all of our horizontal assets are managed to the engineering division, so the, the roadway improvements, the water, and tonight we'll talk about the sewer. Because uh, this summer was particularly brutal for us, and Ward 7 was not immune uh, to the flooding that we had. Uh, we've got several reports throughout the, uh, the summer. Now, flooding is a citywide concern. Obviously, it's a nuisance, but it's also a real public safety and public health issue because our system is extremely old, and we have what's called a combined sewer system. So sanitary flow and stormwater flow go into the same pipes. So when it backs up, that water is dirty and should be avoided. So it really is a public safety and health concern. Obviously, you know, as property owners here, there's always the concern about property damage. And because um, it is a combined system, the circumstances that give rise to localized flooding also com cause combined sewer overflows to the alewife and the mystic, uh, which put us out of permit compliance. But more importantly to us, it actually pollutes our uh, natural resources around us. Now, there are different weather events that are linked to flooding. There's, you know, storm surge, like uh, Hurricane Sandy hit New York City. We're not entirely immune to that. Uh, parts of assembly are actually in a coastal zone for the mystic, uh, so we could actually be susceptible to storm surge. And some of the climate change models indicate that the Amelia Earhart Dam could be flanked in Everett, so storm surges could come up as far as Alewife Brook. So we could, put, could potentially be impacted in Ward 7 by a massive storm surge. Um, then, of course, there's precipitation-based flooding. Usually what we've um, designed the systems around are long sustained rains, usually like a day long rain that dumps a lot of uh, inches of uh, water on us. Of course, there is also snow melt. Um, it, it, it gave a plug for the highway department and the uh, sewer and highway department at the same time. When it snows, be sure to clear out uh, the fire hydrants for uh, fire protection. Also clear out all the catch basins so that when we have snow melt, we don't have localized flooding. What we've been finding recently due to climate change are that we're having short bursts of intense rain. This is actually substantially changing how our system works and how flooding occurs. We did have several reports throughout this summer uh, of flooding and it allowed us to do an analysis. The engineering department looked at local rain gauge information. It made a correlation to when we were having reports of flooding. What we found was when there was a cloud burst of three tenths of an inch in a duration of 15 minutes, that correlated very strongly for when we were getting these reports of localized flooding. We then went back through the records and, and looked at when this was occurring. And it has occurred sporadically throughout the past decade. Past five years has been kind of quiet, uh, but this past year, this year we had 12 such events just this summer, uh, which is why I'm here talking about flooding today. So we do have a multi-pronged approach uh, to this. Uh, before, uh, if a uh, storm is forecast, highway goes out and does extra runs with the street sweepers to make sure that the catch basins will be clear and the streets are clear. The sewer department goes out and cleans catch basins, jets lines for low-lying areas that we know are problematic so that we can, we can get the most capacity as possible out of our existing system. During the, the flood, we typically, DPW Highway and sewer will uh, add additional staff, even if it's going to be overnight, we'll have people on call, so that we can have emergency response. So uh, if you do experience flooding during the event, call 311 or go online on 311 and report it through that. That will go directly to 
sewer and highway, and they'll be able to respond. Uh, you know, sometimes they'll be able to, to push the water uh, or jet uh, lines, clear catch basins, so we, we can get out there for emergency response. Also by submitting that 311, again, because we are a combined sewer community and there's the threat of it being dirty water, the sewer department will also know the next day to go out and sanitize the area. We've got um, chemicals that'll kill all the bugs on the, uh, on the street and clean up the area afterwards. So it's important to dial 311 uh, or through the website on 31 during it. After the event, that's where engineering and IAM kick in. We are in the process of designing system upgrades so that we can better handle these storms. It's important that we continue to collect the data. We've got a very sophisticated model of our system, and that leads us to make design decisions you know, based on, on the macro scale. It's really important that we have the data and understand where we're having localized flooding. So I'd encourage you after the event to email engineering at somervillema.gov um, the time of the event, what your observations were. If you have photos, please send them along to us, not just for future ResiStat, presentations, but so we have the, uh, the data and uh, can design the system accordingly. Now, of course, you know, these are difficult problems to solve. There's many different reasons for flooding, and each flooding instance, it's not entirely unique, but there are different factors and different solutions for different locations. We've got an issue with pipe capacity. There is an issue with uh, density of development and how much runoff we have from the highly impervious surfaces. But even without that, most of the soils in Somerville are pretty lousy anyway, so we don't get much infiltration for the areas that aren't even paved. We've got pipe condition problems. We're dealing with climate change. We have localized uh, geography, not so much here in Ward 7. Um, some parts of Wards 5 and 6 uh, were uh, Tannery Brook, which is now a culvert. A uh, good part of Union Square used to be Miller's River. So there's inherent topography in the city that is challenging because they would have been natural waterways. Uh, and it's difficult to design around the fact that you know, a river used to be there and now it's a pipe. Um, we are very serious about attacking um, this legacy problem. Most of our sewer system was built between 1880s and 1920. It means that our system is over 100 years old. Um, and it was built in a different time when combined sewer systems were allowable. Um, we've, we have a lot of work to do, not only to bring it into sort of modern standards, but also address the fact that most of these pipes are 100 years old and a lot of the pipes are collapsing. We've got a fairly intensive capital improvement projects uh, series of, of programs for the Union Square area. We're now moving beyond the Union Square area with the investigations and it's sort of two prong. One, we're doing, for the first time, uh, as far as I know, ever, a really intensive internal inspection. We're sending closer cameras down so that we know where we have pipe failures, where the pipes uh, need to be rehabilitated to restore existing capacity. But more than that, we're also doing intensive hydraulic modeling and system improvement analysis. Even if we rehabilitate the pipes, it's still the old standards, the combined standard. We need um, to, to put into place new infrastructure to handle these larger storms and handle them more responsibly so we're not polluting our waterways. And it is a multi-pronged approach. It isn't simply about gray infrastructure building more pipes or bigger pipes. We need to handle the stormwater, so it's also stormwater storage. We need to address quality, so we're very interested in green stormwater infrastructure, um, which will compete for space on our narrow roadways uh, with the other things that we need to have there, but it's a very important component. There are a lot of different tools that we have to employ to solve these problems, uh, including flooding and the water quality CSO problems. Um, we have put together a um, capital improvement plan and have put that into our rate structure um, to avoid rate shock in the future so we don't suddenly have to uh, raise sewer rates because we have to do a bunch of work. We know there's a bunch of work that we have to do to the sewers. And we're planning that, and we're, we're, we're projecting the fact that we're going to be doing a lot of capital improvements. And, and the, the water and sewer rate uh, increases will be metered and um, uh, done in a, in a matter that doesn't create rate shock all of a sudden. Um, as we're doing the, the design and uh, looking to, to improve the system, we're not just looking for, to solve today's problems. We're also 
um, facing the reality of climate change. We completed a project this past year. Again, we've got a hydraulic model uh, that allows us to predict what happens with our system. And we use that with climate change scenarios. So this is an example map from that uh, exercise using the 100-year storm, which is a, a storm that uh, has the probability of having, 1% probability of happening in any given year, using climate change projections for 2070. Um, a lot of the, the areas that are predicted to flood are, are areas that we do see flooding right now. A lot of the area down by the Triangle Field, uh, Elmwood Street is a, is a pervasive problem. That's down uh, by where the Tannery Brook used to be, that, right down here. That, that used to be a, a waterway uh, down here, so it actually shows that that area floods. It's not a surprise. Um, the, the Potter House near the Triangle Field. We also have some interesting uh, capacity problems on the hill. You often don't think of hills as flooding, but we've had so much, uh, it, particularly with the cloudburst scenarios, that the catch basins don't have enough capacity to, to take in all the water. And even if we do, the pipes that are there are too small to convey the water. So uh, we, we have sort of surface sheet flooding happening on the back side of the hill. Uh, and North and Raymond is a particular uh, problem uh, where uh, that, that sort of uh, overland flow and flooding is happening and eroding uh, some areas going down uh, towards the Elric Book. So these are all things that we're uh, looking at. Uh, improvements will be uh, rolled out. It's a lot of construction. It took 50 years to construct the uh, system to begin with. I'm hoping to beat 50 years in terms of reconstructing it. In the meantime, we realized that flooding is a serious issue for a lot of people. So what we, we were doing in, in conjunction with that, that climate change analysis is preparing flood risk communication. And these communications have started rolling out on social media. We're um, developing a landing spot, a, a home page for flooding, uh, which will be rolled out hopefully by the end of the month. Um, and uh, the four major languages, English, Spanish, Portuguese, and Haitian Creole. Uh, what property owners can do to pr prepare for floods and protect themselves against the damage from the floods. Uh, and along with the analysis of knowing where the flood hot zones are, we're considering different uh, you know, alert systems, much like you know, when, when a snowstorm is uh, forecast, we have parking bans. Well, we may not have parking bans, but we'll at least have that, that same sort of uh, constituent notification that we are expecting a high precipitation event, you are in a low-lying area, you might want to um, employ some of these uh, property protection measures. So uh, that's a, an early program we'll be uh, moving out soon. I'd be happy to take your questions on flooding or anything else infrastructure. Thank you. Is being considered. Uh, it's a good question. So uh, long term, how much sewer separation is being considered? Sewer separation is being considered as, as one of the primary methods of, of solving both the flooding and the, the CSO reduction. Um, it's too early right now to tell you know, what percentage of our system. We know that it will be physically impossible to get to 100%. So there will be sewer separation, there will be stormwater storage, there will be stormwater uh, um, management of different uh, uh, styles. Um, it, it will definitely be more than 10% of the system. It will definitely be less than 80% of the system uh, somewhere in there. That's, that's uh, the planning effort that we're really focused on right now in the coming year. Um, so a year from now at Resistat or a similar meeting, I hope to have a better answer to that question. What, one other question is, uh, allow it here. Um, are, is the city under any state or federal orders uh, pertaining to the overflows? flows? Oh, that's a very astute question, yes. Um, so we, we, are, uh, we have permits and we are out of that permit compliance because we have CSO events more regularly than we're permitted to do. We're not the only ones in that, um, uh, in that category. Cambridge is in the same category, MWRA is there, Chelsea, Everett, all of the combined sewer communities are spelling more than we're supposed to. Um, the DEP and EPA just extended the water quality variance for the Alewife, Mystic, and Charles. We don't care about the Charles so much. Um, and, and did. There was a sign back there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, it, it ruined Bill Wells' career. He was, he was on the upward trajectory, he jumped in the river. I don't know what happened to him after that. <laughs> um, 
but the, 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 the water quality variance lays out um, planning that we have to do, and it's, it's both separately. Cambridge, Somerville, and MWRA have to separately plan our, our uh, improvements and then get together and coordinate our improvements because there's a lot of crosstalk between the three systems. Um, so we are on a schedule to develop these plans. Uh, we also um, have been, uh, we've received an administrative order from EPA, which lays out timelines for us to, to do this planning. And frankly, this was planning that we were doing anyway. We had already essentially created the Department of Infrastructure and Asset Management. We had already started moving on that, um, that path to do this planning and do these system improvements. And then these other sort of regulatory timelines came out which aligned fairly well with what we were planning to do anyway. Is the administrative order available online or through? Um, it should be. It's, um, it's being finalized right now, so as soon as it's, it's countersigned, um, we, we should post it on the engineering website. Thank you. May I? Um, yeah, uh, you mentioned something about the basins overflow uh, and mixed with sewerage, and then it's treated. The areas are treated. Is that right? After we have a, a, a flood event, the sewer department will go out uh, and, and spray some chemicals and, and uh, um, mop up the area and get it back into the, to the system. So there are cleaning uh, efforts that sewer department does after these things. So the, this probably isn't a, a, a good question for you or a logical question for you, but do you get involved at all with treating the sewers for rats? Because I'm seeing uh, an uptick in the rat activity uh, in Ward 7, and uh, some people say they see it, others say they don't. I thought maybe there'd be somebody here tonight that could speak about the rat problem. Um, it is a problem here. We, we do have an environmental health specialist who is focused almost exclusively on rats. She is not here tonight, um, but uh, she is developing reports. And um, she did a, an extensive study in Ward 1 uh, that is informative. Uh, I wish Georgiana was here. She's, I don't know if you've met her before. She's phenomenal. Um, she has some robust data this year. I don't have that with us. I will say in general, uh, yeah, this year voting reports are up. I haven't got the raw data before me, but rest assured in terms of climate change being localized, the impacts, milder winters, you seem to localize the effects when you see more mosquitoes, rodent population, so forth. I believe the data shows you might get some in the sores, but the, the, the buffet is upstairs at the end of the day. And I don't want to get too much, I've learned more about rodents than I wanted to know in this job, but really the reproduction rate, we can't even keep up with that, and that's a big thing. So I promise that the next meeting she will we'll get her here. She usually, she probably just could be here tonight. She's fantastic, uh, and uh, hopefully we don't lose her. Uh, and she's doing a lot of good pilot work and experimental work and would want to carry around the rest of the city. But rest assured, if there's a mild winter, that population's spiking, just like the mosquitoes do and, and, and other types of species. So, um, so I, I don't doubt it's up here, because we're, we're seeing those calls everywhere. But not always directly to what's happening on the ground, mostly above ground, and on the reproduction side. I'm sorry to have to say that, so. Yes. Hi, I already have the microphone. Um, so as far as flooding and as far as preventing water having to go into the sewer system, we just lost a whole bunch of trees on Air Wife Book Parkway and a private resident, which cut the big, beautiful trees down just before the ordinance kicked in. Um, the street near me, Weston Manor, I'm sorry, Weston Street, used to be a dirt road when I moved here, and it was lined with big trees. All of these kinds of things prevent, uh, trees will suck up and hold a lot of water. Um, Dirt roads, obviously, uh, are permeable. So I'm looking at this picture of Clarendon Hill housing that may go forward. Are you doing things about requiring permeability so that water goes right down into the uh, soil and into the groundwater rather than through the, through the sewer system? Yes, we do. So the engineering department reviews all development plans. Anything that needs a building permit comes through engineering. Okay. Um, and when we do that, um, we are, our, our main focus, we review things for other things, but you know, really our, our primary concern is reducing stormwater runoff. So we look to maximize permeability on the lots. We also require many instances um, subsurface detention systems, which cost the developer money, but uh, are, are really crucial to reducing the amount of runoff uh, from, from those development lots. We are also uh, exploring um, ways that we can encourage 
uh, private property owners who aren't doing renovations to better manage stormwater on their own site. Um, so it, it's, it's because, you know, roughly two thirds to three quarters of the land in Somerville is privately owned. So two thirds to three thirds uh, of the runoff that hits our street isn't something that we directly manage. So we're looking for ways to, to better manage stormwater on site. Uh, let me say one other thing with respect to the, all of the new building and the luxury condos that keep coming up in Somerville. A lot of them are built right up to the sidewalk and there used to be strips of land, there used to be trees, there used to be bushes, there used to be permeable land around those homes that were knocked down. And I think a lot of your flooding is coming because now there's only a building next to a sidewalk and where is the water going to go? Yeah, and, and those, so those are the ones where we're typically requiring subsurface detention. Good. Because we, we lose that, that sort of buffer strip. Exactly. So if you're going to build up to a zero lot line, then you have to manage the stormwater on site and they'll typically have to put a tank or something underneath their driveway or elsewhere to store and infiltrate. Good, I'm glad to hear it's required, thank you. Okay. Thank you all for your time and attention.